In this video, today we are going to be going through my entire year's worth of lesson plans for seventh grade world studies. But before we get there, my name is Brooke and this channel is That New Teacher where we inspire, encourage, and empower you to be the best teacher that you can be. Let's do it. But first, coffee. All right, the coffee is here. We're gonna do this. This is a long video because it's a whole year worth of pacing. So, you know, grab your own cup of coffee and let's get started. When I was a first year teacher, I had no idea how long to spend on each section. Um, this was my first year in this content, so I will tell you what I did and maybe what I will change up. My husband called to ask if it was too early for Chick-fil-A, and the answer is never. All right, so if you watch my Ancient Civilizations content video, um, you'll notice it was a lot of lecture notes, quiz, lecture notes, quiz, and this seventh grade class specifically was ready for anything. So I experimented a little and threw in some random simulations and different things like that. So I was able to be a lot more creative with this class. Um, and so you'll see a little more of that in today's content. And I'm going to get caught every single time on this book. The curriculum that we use at our school is by Bob Jones University, the World Studies one. It comes with a textbook. My students are using a hard textbook and then it comes with an activity manual and my students were using a digital one. I do not do all of the activities in the activity manual. I mostly use them to supplement and review. Um, basically like I'm going to teach you in class and then you're going to practice on your own maybe twice a week doing an assignment from here. The term activity is used very loosely. It's um, more like matching things, map activities and stuff like that. It's not like there's a lot of primary source document analyzing and stuff like that. So that is what our activity manual looks like, if you're wondering. All right, so world studies in California state standards. Um, when I started this year, I made the mistake of assuming that my textbook was based off of state standards and it was exactly what I needed to teach in order to cover all the state standards fully. I was completely incorrect. There is so much extra. It does cover all the state standards, but there's so much extra in here that I did not need. So I was pushing my students and pushing myself to get through every single page of this book and it was completely unnecessary. So the first thing I would suggest for you for if you're planning out your pacing is to figure out what part can you cut? What part do you need? If you're hearing birds in the background, it's because I'm in my garage. It looks like a nice little, you know, indoor little set of my home, but it's the garage. All right, let's see how we got started. If you watched my sixth grade video, you know that I uh, started the year with COVID. So I did not get to go to the in-service week. So that would be the first week of school for me would have been meetings and working in my classroom. And then we have our back to school night during that week. I was not there. I recorded a video for them. And then um, the first three days of school are Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I missed all three of those days because my quarantine was not over yet. This was in the days of the extended where you had to have like the super long quarantine. It didn't matter. I was so sick. So I had big plans on what I was going to do, but I had to make very sloppy sick day sub plans that they all survived and they got on Google Classroom without me. But um, so. The things that I had planned to do was kind of do this revolving seating situation where they, you know, sat according to their birthday or according to their height. And then when we got back, I would make it more assigned and more structured after those first three days of kind of hopping around and observing who they like to sit by and who they work well with. One of the things I do at the beginning of the school is make them have name tents where they can have their name and I can learn their name. They bring it to school every day for about a week and then um, hopefully I can learn 140 names in a week. Um, I played, I planned to play a get to know you bingo and do a digital stations activity where they would go through the stations on Google Slides and do a syllabus scavenger hunt, a sign up for different um, resources that I use. Maybe if you use like Nearpod or something like that and you need them to connect those, that's what I was gonna do for like Flipgrid and things like that and do an all about me student survey. And those were supposed to be the first three days of school. It didn't look like that at all. It was spicy. The, f the second week of school, the first full week of school, I jump into content. I was gonna do an investigate the teacher activity. I was back at school, but I was feeling terrible and I was not ready to do a, an activity in a room full of students that I hadn't met yet and have them walk around my room and investigate me. I wasn't ready for that. So we jumped into a why do we study history assignment. I tried to get them onto our digital platform for our activity manual. This 
um, went really badly. It was their first time using this platform as well for the company and it was my first time using the platform. It ended up taking about two days of having them do like fake assignments. I called them fake because I wasn't grading them and it was mostly just to teach them the process of turning in assignments. So they were typing in fake answers. Like I was just like giving them an assignment on this platform and then be like, okay, you're going to type A, B, C, D, E, F, G and then turn it into me. This is how you know it's turned in all the way. It, it, it's kind of a little bit of a confusing process. So I took two days and it took even more. It pretty much took two weeks really to get everyone fully on the platform. But I took about two days doing that. So again, I went perfectly by our textbook thinking that I needed to. Um, so our textbook starts at the beginnings of the human race and talks about like the beginning of people and earliest human history. And it kind of brings in that history of Israel. It's a Christian based curriculum. So it's gonna bring in some of that content going over different covenants from ancient Israel. Um, it ties into what they learned in sixth grade. I don't know if it's actually necessary for seventh grade standards. It might be something I cut next year, but we did spend a week on that first chapter covering these things and talking about how it all went through. And then um, it talks about the early spread of Christianity. And this does actually tie in to state standards and um, like into Rome and Roman persecution and things like that. So. We pulled that in, and for that, I showed, if I remember right, I showed some videos from Mankind, the story of all of us. And then after the first full week of school, I'm giving my students a taste of my pattern of the way that I divvy up the, the work is basically we're going to learn, we're going to take notes. You're going to use those notes on a quiz every single Friday. Every Friday that we have school, you will have an open note quiz. If there's no school on Friday, it might be on Thursday or you might be off the hook. But if it is a Friday and we are not taking a test or just took a test the day before, you will have an open note quiz in my class. So um, at the beginning of the year, they're like five questions long and they're really short. And then as we go through the year, it starts to be about 12 questions long. I found that 12 is the amount that my students like. They don't like when you only miss one question and then you end up with like a D. They don't like that. So like a three question quiz would they, they, it sounds less intimidating, but at the end of the day, their parents getting that notification on the grade program that says, oh, your student got a D and they're like, I only missed one question. So that is how I check progress throughout the school year. On to the second full week of school, the third week of actual school, and it's bringing us into September. I closed out chapter one pretty quickly and um, gave them a chapter one quiz. I won't be giving that again next year because that's confusing to them. I already give them quizzes. I didn't want to call it a test because it was such a short chapter. Like we only spent four days on it. I'll probably just continue on and not assess that fully um, with like a very serious quiz test thing. All right, which brings us to the first really full chapter of study which for us is titled the rise of islam and it's all about islamic beliefs and islamic uh advancements in technology and mathematics and things like that that is definitely um heavy in the state standards for california so it's nice to get that done right away we talk about the five pillars of islam um what else do we talk about we talk about the culture of islam technological advancements philosophy we talk about the byzantine empire and how they interacted and that is it, it and this then it actually starts our full unit so i spent about two weeks on that islam study that chapter and then we did a test i didn't spend a full week reviewing for that test because it is a smaller test um but maybe spent about two or three days reviewing and then gave them their test and then we went on to the next unit and the next unit is sub-saharan africa my students were really excited for this chapter um so first we talked about african culture which is like agriculture, crops, livestock, things like that. Because um, we're talking about like year 500. No, year zero to 1600. So we're talking about pretty early. We talk about iron working, the importance of extended families. These are the things we're talking about in culture. We spend about a day on culture, maybe two days on culture. And then we talk about Eastern Asia. And then we spend a day on Mansa Musa. Um, the kids really like to hear about him being like the richest person ever to have lived. So I show a video on him and then, so we talk about Mansa Musa for a day and commerce and things like that. And we divide uh, Africa regionally into the East and the West are the areas that we're focusing on mostly. And then we go back and circle back to the expansion of Islam a little bit and how that affected Africa. When we're talking about the East, we're talking about trade and Zimbabwe. I honestly stretched it. Like we could have 
my kids were super excited about sub-saharan africa so i wanted to spend more time on it we probably could have finished it in two or three days but um they really liked it so i i went deep and found some like deeper things i showed a ted ed video about mansa musa and things like that so i tried to really stretch this chapter and then I gave a test on it. Next year, I think I'm gonna group Africa and Asia together and do them as like a mini unit, or maybe even just do unit tests instead of, I did a test for every single chapter because I thought that's what you were supposed to do, right? But now that I'm looking back on it, a lot of time is lost in that review test thing. Like, like I spent, you know, two, one, two, three days reviewing for the chapter three test for a, a, a chapter that we studied for about three or four days, right? So you got three days of review, three days of actual content. It, it stretches it out. So I think I'm gonna find a way to do less tests next year or maybe group more cultures together and do like larger unit tests next year. I wasn't ready for that when I was at this point in the year, in the school year. I wasn't quite like aware of how that would feel like spending that much time reviewing. So that's one thing I would change. And then we're on to, we're in about the end of the year. If so, at this point, we're about to the end of September and we are in chapter four of our book, which is the expansion of Asian cultures. We spend a day on commerce in China, which is like agriculture, population, growth of cities, things like that. And then we go to innovations the next day and we talk about trade. So we spend about two days there on China and then we're gonna spend a couple days in Japan. We talk about government, religion, Shintoism. This should kind of be a review for the sixth graders because we covered these cultures and these religions in sixth grade. We also talk about Vietnam, Cambodia. And then we get to the rise of the Mongol Empire. I like talking about the Mongols because seventh graders like learning about the Mongols. And I don't know, just like talking about their fighting tactics and things like that. It's just something to spark some excitement in the kids. So. So we, we spent a good time like sitting there with the Mongols talking about their fighting tactics and what it would have looked like when they were sieging a city and their pretend retreat tactics. The kids really liked that. So um, we stuck with that for about a day and a half, a day and then one of the quiz days and a half because it it's really only like three pages in our textbook. It's four. Ah, it's five, right? So we spent a couple, we spent a couple days sitting with the Mongols because they really like the Mongols. And then we go to the different kingdoms in, I think it's uh, Southeast Asia. And that pretty much wraps it up for our Asian cultures. Oh, and I use the, and for the Mongols, Crash Course has a really good video on the Mongols. So I split that up over two days. Crash Course videos are great, but he talks really fast. And for a middle schooler, it's hard for them to gather all that information. They start just glazing over and like, it's just, words flying around them. So I like using crash course videos, but I like splitting them up into manageable chunks. So now we're in the first week of October. It looks like I introduced CNN 10. I don't do anything extra with CNN 10. It's just kind of, I don't want to use it as a filler, but it can be a time filler. But actually I want them to engage with current events, especially if they're a reflection of what we're studying or what we have studied. Um, but I don't make them do an assignment about it. I want them to be excited to learn about current events. So I throw in a CNN 10 video once a week, once every other week, just for fun learning, right? So they get excited about CNN 10 and uh, that's that. We're So we're finishing up chapter four, doing some vocabulary review and stuff like that for the Asian empires. And then did I give them a test? Let's find out. I did. I did give them a test on chapter four because I was, so serious about testing every single chapter. So we did a CNN 10 and a Blookit review. I make my own Blookits. I don't regret it ever. I feel like making Blookits and Gimkits and quizzes and cahoots raise my students scores. A lot of history is memorization and if I can give them a tool to help them memorize, then I'm going to. And then it kind of secretly gives away some of the test questions and answers and like, I don't give them all the test questions and answers because you gotta do work for yourself, right? Aha, next was um, the emergence of European culture. California state standards focus very strongly on European culture and um, it's also really boring. So it's kind of hard. 
So I like the way that our curriculum breaks it up. You talk about Europe, then you circle around to other parts of the world, then you talk about Europe again, and then you circle around to some other parts of the world, then you talk about Europe again. Um, so that's kind of how it flows for our curriculum, and I followed that, and I'm going to do that again next year. This section is going to talk about feudalism. We spend a day on feudalism. I love to talk about feudalism. No idea why. I don't actually like feudalism. But for some reason it's fun to talk about and the kids get it. It's like a concept that can really click and they can feel like they 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 got challenged and also rose to the challenge where they understand the hierarchy, the social hierarchy. The next day was about papal authority. My kids had a hard time grasping that for some reason, so I'm gonna look at it differently next year. We just took did a le lecture notes style. I'm gonna have to find a way, maybe a simulation or something to help them understand papal authority and how important it was to Europe at that time. Then we talked about the decline of feudalism for one day, and then we talked about the Crusades for a day. I feel like it was longer. I remember drawing pictures on the board of the Crusades that were terrible. Okay, yeah, we spent one day on the Crusades, and then the next day about money, culture, the next day art and literature, and then um, we had a day, it was supposed to be one day on calamities, which is like the Great Famine, the Black Death. Um, I have a, a particular student who that was going to be a hard topic for them, so I split it into two days, even though it didn't need to be split into two days. But when I do it again next year, I'll probably combine those onto the same day. Um, the Black Death is one page in our notebook, and I don't, I don't need to sit there and spend a whole day on that. We had a quiz and the unfair game, which means the test must be coming up on European culture. So the next chapter that was going to be covered was Renaissance and Reformation. And to be honest, at this point, my students were bored and I was bored of Europe. So I skipped it. You can't skip it because it's definitely in the California content standards. But I told the kids I would circle back to it with different activities. And that's kind of what I did. I sprinkled some random activities, like on a day where I just needed to do, um, I think one of the day we did like, tweets that Martin Luther would have made if he were alive now and nailing his 95 thesis to the board. Just like random activities like that, which is mini lessons, is how I taught Renaissance and Reformation. I did not do the chapter, I moved on because we needed to get out of Europe quickly. So then that brought us to the unit three, and this is one of the things I would do differently. Instead of testing each of those chapters, I think I'm just gonna do unit tests. Unless there's a chapter that I really feel like needs that assessment, I'm just gonna do unit tests um, next year for my seventh graders and that whole unit. So the next unit is called Dominant Powers in Europe and Asia. It's unit three. It covers European exploration, um, Europe colonizing the Americas, transformations in European culture, Oceania and Australia, my favorite chapter, empires and Eurasia, empires of Eurasia. Again, super Eurocentric. So I tried, when we do the European exploration, I tried to focus less on the explorers and more on the people that they were exploring, if that makes sense. Um, so we started off with North America and we did, let's see, one, two days on Native Americans and including like the Mayans and the Aztecs. And then we talked about navigation. We just spent a day on navigation, like what, what does that look like for an explorer at this time? Because us, we can hop on a plane and explore anywhere we want. I can go explore Paris tomorrow, right? But um, we talked about navigation and the tools they would use, astrolabe, compass, different things like that. And then we spent one day talking about early European explorers. And um, one of my favorite days in this section is the day that we talk about conquest and consequences. Because obviously a lot of this exploration turned into... Not, I don't just like to look, go look at that thing. I, I think that place is really cool. Let's go explore it and see what there is there. Now I want it and I want it for myself. And what did that look like and what were the consequences of those choices? So we spent a day on that. The next day we did uh, a video from the story of mankind and a review. Uh, the story of mankind for all of us. I was watching them for free somewhere and then now they cost money and they're on like the history vault or you can buy them episode by episode on Amazon Prime, so I'm just buying them at this point. I know some teachers will be mad that I'm buying things. I don't know. If it's going to save me time and it's going to um, help my students understand the concept better, it's worth it to me. So, 
So we're reviewing for this age of exploration test. We are in mid-November at this point, and I'm gonna do a CNN 10 and a review, and then we're going to take our chapter seven test, the age of European exploration, and on to the next chapter. A whole page just flew out of my book. Hallelujah. I made a mistake. We've got a gap in my planning here. I do pretty good job of planning everything out and being very clear. Um, and I love referencing it back when I'm planning for the next year, but sometimes I make mistakes. We got a break. We got Thanksgiving break. It was a whole week. Hallelujah. So the next section of our book is Europe colonizing the Americas, both North America and Latin America, South America. So this is like a lot of it's hard for the kids to grab onto. So I spent three days on the colonization of Latin America and really told the story of each of the sections that it was focusing on. So what were they? So the part in our book that talks about the colonization of Latin America really talks about the different social structures that were happening within the colonies at the time. So it talks about like the Portuguese um, donatarios and things like that. And it talks about the peninsulares. And so we talked about those and my students really liked learning that because it was more culture based. So we kind of tried to look at it from culture. Like what does a hacienda look like and who lives there? And compare it to where other people might've been living at the time. I specifically remember a student gravitating when we talk about mestizos because that was her culture and she was like, is that still a thing today? Like she was really into that. So I really like bringing in the culture, especially where I live here in the Bay Area. We're a very diverse group of folks here in the Bay Area in California. So it's nice to dive into culture when I can and focus less on the colonizers and focus more on the people who were living there. That's what I prefer to do. Next, we go into the colonization of North America. I'm brief here. like. It's a it's a blip on the radar. The students have learned about the pilgrims. Like they know at this point about the pilgrims and the exploration of the new world. And I know I'm teaching them again in eighth grade and we're coming back to this like deep dive into US history. So I spent like one day on that. And then there's a section in our book on the struggles for independence in every single one of those colonies. I think I'm gonna rework this next year and when we learn about Portugal, just learn about Portugal and their independence. Then when we learn about North America, North America and their independence from the colony situation. So um, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do differently next year instead of focusing, it was very much like, okay, here's how the Spanish colonies got free. Here's how this colony got free. Here's how Brazil got free. And it was just very like a day of independence, but it was very confusing for the students to hop from country to country like that all day long. Did we take a test? I bet you we did. Oh, we didn't because it's finals week. So we spent a whole week studying for finals at this point. We call them finals. They're midterms at Christmas time. It's gonna be a midterm at the, the winter break. So I give them their study guides. We played, what did we do? We did a matching review that's like matching vocabulary to review. We did the unfair game. We went over their study guides. Usually I pick one day of that week. My study guides are like 100 to 120 questions long. So um, one session of the day will be, one of the sessions of study will be all the kids going around saying what number question they want and I will give them the correct answer for that. I don't give correct answers to the study guides. Like we've already, I've already, I always say, I already gave you all the answers. All year long I've been giving you the answers. Now you gotta go back and find them in the notes, find them in the assignments, find them in the quizzes, find them in the tests, and put them on your study guide and study them. Use your resources, be a researcher, right? But one day I will give out. So if you're listening and paying attention, you'll get like 25, depending how many people are in your class, free answers for your study guide. So after finals week, we get a couple weeks off and then we are in the third quarter, people. All right, let's go. When we got back from Christmas break, I highly recommend doing this. I reviewed procedures. I did the slideshow thing that I normally wouldn't do on the first day of school, but now we've gotten to know each other and it's not first impressions anymore. So we're gonna go over the slideshow and then I gave them a pop quiz, which made them crazy, but it was supposed to be easy. Like you should know where to turn in your papers, where to go when you need a pencil. Those are the kinds of questions. We're just reviewing that stuff for people who either forgot or just need to get back into the swing of school, right? So that's what I did on my first day back. 
So the next section covers political turmoil in Europe. And we start that off with the French Revolution. This event here for my students was one of the most memorable for them in their end of the year survey. This one came up over and over and over again as something that really helped it click for them and they thought it was a lot of fun and just very different, not something you would expect to show up in class. So we did a French Revolution simulation. I found it online for free. I'm gonna work on making a teachers pay teachers version of it because I gotta simplify it down it's part of this big piece of PDF that I just found on the internet like randomly it's weird so um, I'm gonna figure out a way to make it mine and make it yours as well so keep an eye out for that but what we did was this um, first I covered the French Revolution in the typical let's take notes format so we talked about the three different estates. We took notes on those. We talked about Marie Antoinette and King Louis and some economic collapse. And then they came to school the next day. Um, so, I, and then I just left them off with that. Like we, we stopped right there and we didn't, we didn't go into the reign of terror yet. So then um, we met up in class the next day and we did this whole simulation about um, we talked about ec economy a little bit. We gave them, we did some little like, it's like kind of like a KWL chart for, um, but like more basic. Just what do you know about debt, credit, um, a couple different economic terms. And then I split them up into the first estate, the second estate, the third estate. We had, um, we had a pope and we had a king and queen and then they like taxed each other and then I opened up a bread shop but it was actually Jolly Ranchers and candy and um, they could buy it with either they had like very little money because they had to like because they were in the 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 different estate like because they were a peasant or maybe they had a little more money because they were a merchant it was really really memorable a lot of fun my students did great it was fun I loved it so we did a simulation on the French Revolution that took a whole day and then the next day, the standards call for students to contrast the French Revolution with the American Revolution. I don't think that's fair because they haven't learned the American Revolution yet besides like maybe in fifth grade, um, according to the standards, but we go over that as best we can in a day. And then the next day we did a quiz and we talked about Napoleon. And we are into March. Um, we talked about the foundation of industry and then I did on um, that Tuesday, I did a little bit of Mankind, uh, the Mankind video, uh, episode 9, and we talked about Edison, and we did a map of Europe. So this day was no new content, it was just kind of filling in some of the gaps there in their learning. Then we talked about expansion and reform, we're talking about like social reforms and stuff like that. And then we played the urban game, if you haven't looked up the urban game, do yourself a favor. If you teach the Industrial Revolution in Europe, the urban game is a lot of fun. Um, it definitely came up in my student survey um, as a day that people hated, but like at the same time you still learn, right? I don't know. They hated it in like a love-hate relationship kind of way. Urban game. Look it up. Uh, open note quiz, as always. Friday, we did CNN 10 and an open note quiz. Papa. All right, next we went into the end of slave trade and then we spent a day doing an industrial revolution timeline. I had the students look up different things that had been invented during the industrial revolution in Europe specifically, and then they had to put those on a timeline. They had to pick 10 things. They had to draw three of them. It was, I just made it up. It, there's no teachers pay teachers, there's no download. I just made that up on a regular blank sheet of paper. Take it, it's yours, free of charge. Um, then the next day we did some Jeopardy review and did a letter from Wes, uh, John Wesley as a primary source analysis. And then the next day was one of those Thursdays where we have an open note quiz because there's no school on Friday and their timelines, their industrial revolution timelines were due that day. Seventh grade, we got CNN 10 and Blookit the next week and their chapter 13 tests. I almost always give tests on either Tuesdays or Thursdays. That's just my personal preference. I feel like um, kids don't remember when they come to school on a Monday. Also, I don't expect them to study over the weekend, um, but that's just me. And then Fridays, we're gone, we're done. None of us wanna be here. We're not gonna study for a test and take a test well on a Friday, but that's my personal experience with my students. Then, the blessed assurance happened. At this point, we have covered everything that the state of California expected us to cover. Part of the beginning of my school year, 
was beautiful because we pushed through the content well and my students in seventh grade were able to take that and run with it but it was a lot and I will slow down next year for sure but then at this point we were free to learn what we wanted to learn so outside of the California state standards I asked my students what in your book because there's still a whole chunk of book left that California doesn't expect them to learn until high school so I was like what in your book do you want to learn and I just sent out a Google form and asked them what they want to learn and of course because they're middle schoolers they picked war so they said they wanted to learn about Africa and they wanted to learn about World War One and World War Two so I read to them out loud a long walk to water I read to them out loud a long walk to water and that was how we covered what they wanted to learn about Africa um, so we got to walk through that book. I love that book. It's perfect for seventh grade, sixth grade kind of age group. Um, it's exciting, but not like overly graphic. Um, and it's true. So then you can even do follow up assignments. I think next year, if I, you know, stretch this a little differently, I'll do some follow up assignments where they get to learn more about the true stories of what happened. So love that. Long Walk to Water was how we covered that. And I just did that as a read aloud, a chapter here, a chapter there. It wasn't any kind of no follow-up assignment, no test, no nothing, just for fun reading and learning. And then we did units on World War One, World War Two. I bought these units because I wanted it to feel different since they were picking it. Um, and I just wanted to get away from this and from the PowerPoint slides and the this and that. So I bought the World War One and World War Two units from Students of History on Teachers Pay Teachers, and I do not regret it for a second. I bought the whole unit bundles, yes, with my own money. Yes, you can write it off on Texas later, but you don't get it all back. But it was fun, and the, it was less work on me because there were really good activities built in there, um, really beautiful PowerPoints built in there, so 10 out of 10, highly recommend. All right, so we started World War One. We spent a day on World War One causes, and we did the new weapons of World War One assignments. My students were really not familiar with World War One. They were interested, but not familiar. Most people know more about World War Two. Um, then we talked about the Zimmerman telegram, and we did some more of the events in the note-taking part of it. We did a quiz, and I started Long Walk to Water that day. The next week, we talked about when America enters the war and we did an over the top activity. Over the top is an online game that your students can play and it's kind of like they walk through different things and they can make decisions that will affect their outcome in the war. Um, to be clear, trigger warning, some students will um, perish in the war. So be ready for that if that's not gonna fit your student's ability. Um, then we talked about the Spanish flu. Oh, it looks like I flip-flopped these two days for one reason or another. But we did CNN 10 and we did the Spanish flu group work. Um, there's a stations activity in that bundle where they went through and saw primary sources um, from the Spanish flu and that was a really cool activity. We read Long Walk to Water and we finished our World War I notes the next day. And then we did an open note quiz in Kahoot and had no school on Friday. We're getting our way into April now. I had said we were gonna do a post-war map of what the countries looked like after the war. We didn't get to that, I cannot remember why, but um, we just did this vocab matching review, CNN 10 and Gimkit, and we had our World War One test. And then following our World War One test, I did a movie called The Lost Battalion. It is a made for TV movie, so it's rated TV 14, but there's not a lot of crass language. There's some, but it's like, I, I teach at a pretty conservative school, so I have to be very careful, and it, it suits the needs of that, if that's something you're looking for. It's called The Lost Battalion. My students got really into it, more than I expected them to be into it, screaming at the TV, um, but it was good. It took about three, uh, I wrote a note for myself next year, three full days, so I must have given it like uh, one and a half or two and a half. It needs three full days to get through the movie, and I bought on Teachers Pay Teachers a viewing guide and then edited it down. I usually do a viewing guide on the first day of a movie and then the following days I just let them watch it. So I did say like I'm very careful about how I show films and there's always going to be an assignment attached to it but I try not to make it every single day of the movie like let them watch it and get sucked into the storyline right? Then we went on to World War II uh, again still working in the Students of History um, unit bundle. We, we spent two days on the rise of the dictators. So we talked about Stalin, we talked about 
uh, Mussolini, we talked about Hitler, who else? Uh, Tadeki Tojo, Hideki Tojo, and um, oh, there was more on there. There's more to learn about dictators, but I can't remember off my head. But they do this pop-up activity where they're literally rising off the paper, you cut them out and um, take notes on it. It's very interactive, pretty cool. Um, then we talked about appeasement. We did an assignment where they read and reflected on appeasement and what it looks like as a political policy. What, do, How do we practice appeasement in our own lives? Like maybe trying to get your brother off your back or something, right? Um, read Long Walk to Water some more. Uh, that was the reading analysis on appeasement. So I must have done notes on appeasement and then done the reading analysis the next day. Then we had a break for testing, standardized testing a week off and then a week off for our spring break. And then when we came back, we went to the allied leaders and that was two days of notes with a little bit of long walk to water. And I really like doing illustrated vocabulary assignments where students have to put in a definition. So I gave them some World War II vocab. I think this came from the students of history stuff too. It had World War II vocab. They had to go find a picture online, paste it in the slide and then write the definition on the side. Students want to copy and paste definitions. Um, but otherwise I still think it's cool because it gives them an image in their mind of what the different things were like what was Operation Overlord and stuff like that things that they wouldn't normally have a picture for in their mind um, Then we took notes on so two days of allied leaders I had a video I gave myself no other details note to future self write more words um, Then we did World War II battles notes and that took two days and a little bit of long walk to water. Then we had an open note quiz and I left myself some time to finish notes or keep reading a long walk to water. Sometimes your plans look like this and that's okay, right? We got crossed off stuff. We got to change our minds and move it over here. That's okay. So it looks like what I ended up doing was, I said end at camps. Oh, I was gonna do the Holocaust and then it didn't feel right. So I had to like move some stuff around. Um, so I did a long walk to water. I read the story about the two-time atomic bomb survivor and we started watching Battle at the Smithsonian. Night at the Museum is the first one. Battle at the Smithsonian was the second one. Um, this one, I was mad at myself. I never finished that movie with my kids. I hate doing that. I hated when teachers did that where they like started a movie and never finished it. So to my seventh grade class, to my seventh grade class of 21, 22, I deeply apologize for not finishing that movie with you. Okay. We ended up having a spiritual formation day and that kind of ended the movie. And then, oh, groups that contributed. I loved that activity. There's a minority groups activity in Students of History. Each, uh, I had the kids sit in groups of like six and they each got assigned a minority group that contributed to the efforts of World War II. So one of them was Rosie the Riveter, representing women in the workforce. We had the Navajo Code Talkers. Uh, we had the Tuskegee Airmen, and there were more. So we um, each student group learned about them, and then they went up and presented to the class. It went good. It went pretty good. I, I was impressed. Then we went to Washington, D.C. Love it. Then we had to come back and try to learn. <laughs> um, and we were getting ready for our World War II test. So they had their study guys before we went to Washington, D.C., we came back, we reviewed our study guides, we played Jeopardy, we played Gim Kit, we took a test, and then we finished up with the last chapter of our book, which is more present day stuff and like how all the things we learned are gonna be applied. Like basically like how are you going to become a good citizen in this world? And wrestling with some of the more difficult things that we're facing, things like the environment. And this chapter was more about, for me, just like posing a bunch of questions. I don't like giving kids answers. I want them to find them themselves and come to conclusions themselves. So we look at different energy sources um, in our modern day and look at our economy as it is now. We talked about some of the, uh, like the European Union and how they have their economy. And we talked about technology and the benefits and um, struggles that we have due to technology. A benefit here, me and you talking right now. Uh, we talk about politics and religion, and then we are on to studying for our finals. We get one week of studying for finals. Again, um, if you watched my first one, I had said we were going to do a one-pager. Every time this year I said we were going to do a one-pager, I didn't do it. I don't have a good reason why. It's just how it worked this year. Um, so I said they were going to do a one-pager and study. We just studied. That's it. 
studying, review game, study, review game, review game, review game, take your final, sign the yearbooks, go home. All right, so that is my whole year of seventh grade and lesson plans. Seventh grade is my, my favorite content-wise this year and just the way that it flowed and went, I'll probably make the least amount of changes. The biggest change I'm going to make is the units, grouping things into better units. But I hope this was helpful to you. I know I was looking for content like this when I was a new teacher. How long do I spend on a unit? What do I do here? How many weeks should this take? How many days should this take? So I hope it's helpful for you. If you are also teaching U.S. History, I'm going to make a U.S. History one and I have an Ancient Civilizations one. Thank you for sticking around. If you've been around this whole video, bless you. Invisible extra credit goes to you. And this is that new teacher, and we will see you in the next one.